Hello, book lovers, and welcome to another episode of the Public Library Podcast. My guest today is Jennifer Weiner. She's the author of Mrs. Everything. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I am so excited because, one, I love your work. Thank you. I own every book you have. Oh, thank <laughs> you. That's nice. And um, I loved this book. Mm, thanks. A big juicy read is how you just described it. Uh huh. But tell everybody, what is Mrs. Everything about? All right, so Mrs. Everything is the story of two sisters who um, are born in Detroit in the 1940s, um, and we follow them. We follow them for their whole lives. We we see the 60s through their eyes. We see the 70s and feminism and Reaganomics and all of the changes and all of the progress, all of the movement forward, all of the steps back, and we see their daughters sort of take up the take up the struggle, I guess you would say. So it's about women in America. Why did you want to tell this story? Well, I always knew that someday I was going to try to do a big, sweeping historical book. Um, one of my favorite books is this book by Susan Isaacs called, called Almost Paradise, and it's about this man and a woman who get married and you see their parents and you see their grandparents and you see all the things that, that led to them becoming who they are as they sort of move through their own lives and, and their marriage and their children. So I, I always knew I wanted to do that and the research really scared me because mm. you know it's very easy to write in the present and just like I know what people are wearing, I know what they're listening to, I know how things are. Um, but obviously, when you're writing about a, a period of time when you weren't alive, you have to do some homework. And I, it was interesting. So after the 2016 election, I, I think a lot of um, creative people were sort of doing a gut check and thinking like, okay, what do I do now? Like, what am I supposed to be doing now? How can I be useful at this moment in history? And I wanted to write a dystopian book. I wanted to write a book about a future where abortion was illegal and there would be women involved in the struggle. And I tried and I tried and I tried and I just couldn't get it. I just couldn't make it work. It was mm -hmm. like I was not Margaret Atwood in the end, which was very sad for me. But then I sort of was thinking like, okay, what if I just tell a story about women and what if that's my big book? Okay. And so that's what happened. So you tell the story primarily through the eyes of two sisters, mm -hmm. Joe and Bethy. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the, these wonderful characters. All right. So if you're if you're thinking those names sound very familiar, and you're you know you have Mrs. you have little women echoing mm -hmm. in your mind, that is not an accident. So Joe is the older sister. Joe is the tomboy. Joe is the rebel. Joe is the sister who does not fit in at all and doesn't want to wear skirts to school and wants to play stickball with the boys in the neighborhood and doesn't want to follow any of the the rules for being a good girl. And then there's her little sister, Bethy, who is the pretty, perfect, talented, everybody loves Bethy, she's so great, who kind of gets knocked off her moorings a little bit. Um, and, and what was interesting to me is as I, as I wrote and got deeper into their story, sort of watching the good girl and the bad girl swap places. Yes. So you end up with Joe, the rebel, having this extremely conventional life, this extremely, you know, everything looks really good from the outside life. And Bethy, who was all set up for, you know, the husband and the kids and the white picket fence, is off dropping acid and, and dancing at Woodstock wearing nothing but a handful of mud and beads on a chain. And it was interesting sort of, you know, all of the things that happen to women. And I think if you read the book, like you, you will encounter all of the things all of them. that happen to women. <laughs> I mean, there is, there is trauma, there is, there is rape, there is abortion, there is racism, there's prejudice, there's sexism, there's sexual harassment, there's Me Too stuff. I mean, it's all there. And there's I, fashion faux pas. There's fashion faux pas, yes, of course. And I wanted, there's jello. There's a lot of bad <laughs> stuff. You will not eat jello the same way after this book. No. But, but I wanted to talk about all of the, the things that, that we as women endure and all of the ways that it shapes us and changes us and, and, and how we then go on to change our world. I grew up late 60s, early 70s, and one of the things that I recently learned that you also included in this book was the fact that women could not get credit 
unless their husband yes. said that it was okay. Yes. If you were married, you couldn't get your own credit. Couldn't get, couldn't get a credit card, couldn't buy a house. Um, the thing that I learned in the book that shocked me was that marital rape did not exist as a concept yes. until like 1983. Like husbands, it's just like, well, that was a marriage and you wanted to have sex with your wife. Well, you could do that. That was your right as a husband. I mean, it's, you know, I, I thought I knew a fair amount about history and about women, but I learned some stuff that, that shocked me. So the, st the setting is in Detroit. Did you have a connection with Detroit already? <clears throat> yep. Or was that part of the research as well? Well, I definitely had a connection. My mom grew up there. Okay. I grew up going to Detroit and um, being aware of, of her life there. And also, as I got older, sort of figuring out a little bit of the racial history of Detroit, the riots in mm -hmm. 1968 and what they did to the city and what the, the mayor did to the city and the, the white flight, which happened in so many cities but was so extreme in Detroit. And you had cities that went on to rebuild themselves. I mean, there were a lot of riots in the 60s. There was a lot of dissent. There was a lot of destruction. But you had places that came back from it. And then you had Detroit, which kind of never did. And, and in addition to being a, a one industry town that rises and falls on the fortunes of, of car manufacturing, you know, it was, it, it was an interesting sort of microcosm and a place to talk about race and talk about the economy and talk about Jews and assimilation and, and people who sort of become part of the larger culture versus people who choose not to or, or, or are less able to. But I, it was interesting because I went back to Detroit. I did a research trip with my mom mm -hmm. and my younger daughter um, right before Election Day this fall. And I, I was driving through the city with my mother on, on Woodward Avenue, which is sort of their broad street. And she was showing me, you know, the way that like people would keep moving like north and west and north and west. And first the suburbs would become middle class Christians and then the Jews would move there. And then the middle class African Americans would move there and, and just kept pushing out and out and out. And she showed me like where her grandparents lived, which was this like desolated block that had, that had burned mm -hmm. and had never been rebuilt. So I really loved how you covered diversity. I mean, so many different rich topics yeah. that I felt offered learning opportunities. Uh -huh. I enjoyed the time travel in this book, uh -huh. whether it was through the social issues mm -hmm. or through fashion. Yep. You so brilliantly brought this to life in Thank this book. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And you take, our, you take us across this six decade, I yep. think it was six decades, mm -hmm. um, journey. Mm -hmm. And I imagined a younger generation, younger than me, mm -hmm. um, I'm in my 50s, and I imagine them reading it and learning various things about women and mm -hmm. what we had to overcome as mm -hmm. it relates today. Was that kind of intentional? Well, I, I never want my people, I, I never want readers to feel like this is like their summer assignment. Like okay. This is like they're being <clears throat> whomped over the head with like, you know, this is, this is, you know, educational. Like, I don't want my books to feel educational. I want them to feel fun. I want them to feel entertaining. I want people to care about the characters and what happens to them. But that being said, um, especially now, especially at this moment in history, especially at this moment where reproductive choices are again being debated, mm -hmm. where um, questions of who counts as an American seem to be again up for discussion, I absolutely want readers to know we've been here before. We've been here before in the 60s. We've been here before in the 80s and in the 90s. And it just, it just seems like this, this cyclical thing, like this loop that we'll never get out of, where as women, as minorities, as, as anyone who's outside the mainstream, like you just have to keep fighting those battles. What was the hardest part of writing this book for you from an emotional standpoint? Mm, well, <laughs> my, there was a lot there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> my, my joke is that the hardest part was imagining my mother's sex life. Um, because <laughs> yeah. one, of, one of the characters is very much based on my mom. And my mom was married to a man in the, she got married in like 1968. She had four kids. She lived in the suburbs. My dad left eventually. And 10 years after their divorce, my mom fell in love with a woman. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait, what's happening here? Like, what, what, I did not, did not see this coming, <laughs> you know, like, who even are you, Fran? <laughs> and, you know, my, my siblings and I would be like, well, 
she always liked softball. And I'm like, well, that didn't mean anything. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> what, what, were we supposed to have noticed something? Like, it was this whole big thing. So thinking about um, a character who grows up knowing that she likes women and, and knowing that that's not an okay thing and, and knowing that if she wants a family, she's going to have to marry a man. Like, right. there are no sperm banks. There are no single parents by choice. There no. are certainly no same-sex couples. And so she's going to have to find a way to do that, which is a very traditional way. And thinking about what it must have been like for my mom, knowing that there was a part of herself that she couldn't be honest about, you know, that she had to live her whole life, you know, and... and I've talked to her about it, and she's like, oh, you know, I loved your father. I always knew I could either be with a man or be with a woman, but I'm just, you know, I, I wondered what it was like for somebody who truly did not want to be with men and who knew that was her only option for having a family. Even she thought for a second, the character Jo, mm -hmm. thought for a second, well, maybe this guy I'm married yeah. is like me, right. and he doesn't really even yeah. like women. Right. This would be a great... Exactly. This could work. She's like, that, you know, people make that work, but then she realizes that that is, that is not the case, and this guy is, like, you know, into her in a way that she's not that into him. Um, but she made it work. She made it work. She, she did. Made it work. She did. I mean, I think that she wanted to be a mother. I think, like, my mother wanted to be a mother, but I, I think that... Um, as she watches her own daughters grow up and become parents themselves and, and, you know, has to listen to her daughter say, well, I don't want to work. I really want to be present for my children. And, and Joe has to think, well, wasn't I present for you? Like, what, what, what did I not give you that you seem to be missing and want so badly to give to your own children? And, and I think that that's another interesting thing, the way that we as mothers, like, never give ourselves a break. Like, it's always like, you know, I should have done this differently. I could have done this better. I wish I'd done this some other way. And it, it just, I mean, talk about endless, endless cycles that we'll never get out of. It just seems like there's, we take, as, as mothers and as women, like, we just take so much on our shoulders. It's about not having children and mm -hmm. not being able to have a conversation in an interview about the fact yeah. that perhaps she never wanted them. Because you can't say you that. You can't say that's, that. You know, and I'm a woman without children, and I know that right? space. Yeah, it just, it, it feels like, you know, talk about, like, not being able to, like, live your truth or yeah. speak your truth. I mean, like, not being able to say, like, you know what, I'm not really into men, or I'm not really into children, which I think can feel even more subversive and even more outside of the mainstream. Like, she, you know, and she talks about it in the book about sort of having to enact this story of sorrow and regret and, oh, I wish it had been different. She really doesn't wish it had been different. She's no. very happy with her nieces, and, you know, but I, I wanted... Um, I want readers to think about the the strictures that still bind us in terms of who we're allowed to be, right. what we're allowed to say, and what we're allowed to to own. Like which pieces of ourselves, where we can be, just be like, you know what, I I never liked babies, and the only way I got through raising my children was I had a boatload of help. Like that feels like a scary thing to say and it's it's true in my case I was not good with infants but you know I, I think that there's something like oh you'll be a mother and they'll hand you that baby and you'll just be like floating on this cloud of love and I was not floating on a cloud of love you and know, when like, you're that person mm, you feel like what's wrong with me with me yes. what's wrong with me why what you know where why am I broken why am I not feeling what I'm supposed to be feeling and you feel such guilt and you beat yourself up and you know, and, and men just, I think, go about their business and they do not, you know, question themselves or doubt themselves or torture themselves with thinking about why am I not different? Yes. Well, I've got so many more questions. Ah. I want to take a quick break because uh -huh. I would love it if you would do a reading from Mrs. Yes, Everything. Yes, I would, I would be happy to. Um, all right. So well, we're going to. Yes, we'll take a break. Yes, we'll take a break. All right. We are back on the Public Library Podcast with Jennifer Weiner. She is author of This Is Everything. I'm loving this conversation. Yeah, this is great. It is just wonderful, and we're going to do a reading. Set it up mm -hmm. a little bit, what you're going to read for us. Okay, so Joe and Bethy are teenagers at this point. They're in college, and um, Bethy has gone to the Newport Folk Festival in the summertime, and she has been raped 
um, she dropped acid and some bad guys got a hold of her and now she's come home she's back in in the suburbs of Detroit she hasn't told anybody what what's happened um, and her mother is telling her to get a job and that's where we start you can't just stay here and do nothing for the rest of the summer Sarah finally said just let me rest Bethy begged I can ask at Hudson's, Mom, said Bethy, please, just give me a few days to get myself together. Sarah had grumbled, but she'd finally agreed, and Bethy had dragged herself under the covers like a wounded animal returning to its den. She felt feverish. Her head ached constantly and burned when she peed. I'm just tired, she told herself, just worn down, but the pain kept getting worse. Eventually, she was forced to call her old pediatrician, Dr. Sachs, after her mother had left for work. I think I have an infection, she whispered to the receptionist, who said the doctor could squeeze her in that afternoon. Bethy took the bus to his office, took off her clothes and put on a gown, and lay on her back on a narrow padded table covered with crinkling white paper. Cartoons of Mickey and Minnie Mouse, Donald Duck and Goofy cavorted on the walls. A glass jar of lollipops stood by the sink for good little boys and girls who were brave when they'd gotten their shots. Not too long ago, Bethy had been one of them herself. Hello, hello, said Dr. Sachs, bustling into the room. He was short and pink, with a head bald and shiny as a peeled egg. He tended to Bethy and Joe since they were little girls, treating their chicken pox and their ear infections. Bethy felt almost sick with shame as she whispered her symptoms. The doctor's face became carefully neutral as he listened. I'm going to do an exam, he said, calling the nurse into the room before showing Bethy how to put her feet into the metal stirrups and let her knees fall open. Bethy squeezed her eyes shut, trying not to feel or to hear. We should wait until that comes back, the doctor said. His voice was sympathetic but detached. But my dear, I'm about 99% certain that you have gonorrhea. Bethy lowered her eyes. Her face was burning. It's lucky we caught it, Dr. Sachs said. For women, where it goes undiagnosed, it can cause all kinds of trouble. You could end up sterile. The word and the thought that followed it struck Bethy like a fist hitting her midsection. She bit her lip to keep from gasping, and she counted backwards, sorting through the dates, trying to remember the last time she'd gotten her period. Doctor, she managed to whisper, what if? Dr. Sachs must have followed the progression of her thoughts. He backed toward the door, one hand holding her chart, the other aloft. I'll call you when we have the results, he said. I'll prescribe anti antibiotics. I'll call them right into the pharmacy for you to pick up. You should be fine, he said, and managed to smile before vanishing. The raised hand, the haste of his exit, filled in the rest of the blanks. Don't ask me to help you. I won't do it. Mm. Yes. She goes through some stuff. She goes through some stuff. As women did. You and know. that particular passage made me think about going to my family doctor, mm -hmm. who had known me since I was born, mm -hmm. and asking for birth control pills. Right. It was so awkward. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, uh, you know, and I mean, nowadays it's like girls have options and girls yes. have the internet and like you can figure it out. But like, my God, like back then. Yes. And, um, you know, the pill was just like this. This chapter, I think, happens in 1965 where the pill had like just been invented, but you couldn't get it as a single woman. No. You needed a husband. You had to be married and you needed your husband's permission to be on it. So. There you go. Bethy went through so much. I mean, yeah. uh, um, how did you learn about the drug scene, though? That was one of my favorite. <laughs> I mean, learning about um, the drug culture in the 60s. Oh, God. Or okay. Going, well, going, going, tripping with her. Tripping with Bethy, yes. Was, uh, was, was fun. I, mean, I, I, I will tell you that my mother's don't do drugs speech that she gave to me and my siblings was... Um, don't do drugs because they lace it these days and you don't know if you're getting good stuff like I did in college. <laughs> like, okay, Fran. But I, I read a lot of books about what it was like because I've never, I've, I have done some stuff too, but not acid. Ever. No. So I had to like read about like what that was like and like the walls breathing and stuff. That was good, good times. Now, no one was spared in your book. Both Joe <laughs> and Bethy go through it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they mm -hmm. go through it. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful example of walking a mile in someone else's shoes for me. Oh, thanks. 
Now, I found myself wondering, mm -hmm. whose path would I rather walk? Oh, God, right? If you had to choose one, well, which character's shoes would you rather walk in? Well, here's the thing. I mean, I am a believer in happy endings. Like, I like, I mean, not, you know, perfect, everything wrapped up in a neat little bow, but I definitely like to leave my characters in a better place than where they started. Okay. Like, I like them to go through them, go through some stuff as we all do in our lives but eventually end up in a better place and end up in end up with someone who sees you in all of your strengths and your flaws and your history and i think both sisters got that they did so i i don't know if i could pick i um, and I, I don't, don't, don't want to get, get, get too much of the ending away, but right. I, I think that, um, you know, I think that a lot of women are going to see some of their own choices or maybe even their mother's choices um, and, and be able to understand them a little bit more. It's Although I did have a crush on Harold. Oh, Harold. <laughs> Wasn't he so dreamy? He was. <laughs> Harold is um, someone that Bethy meets in her life. She's mm -hmm. in the same... I think they're, he's classmates with basically yes. both of them. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, he's sort of right between them age-wise. Yeah. And he's a football player who gets sort of dragged into the drama club because they don't have enough boys and he can sing and he's gotten in some trouble with his coach and so he ends up meeting Bethy that way because she's a performer. And they, um, you know, I think that there's an attraction there, but I think that neither one of them acts on it for lots of different reasons. Yes, and not then to they, give anything away. Not to give anything away, but yeah, I liked Harold. I liked him very much. He was fun to write. Now, Joe has three daughters. Mm -hmm. Tell me about coming up with these three very uh, different uh, women uh, uh, uh. and amazing characters. Thank you. Okay, so, you know, I was thinking about my own family and my friends, the women that I've known, I knew that I wanted Joe to have daughters. Mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted, you know, this was going to be a story about women and about sisters. And I knew that I wanted Joe to have daughters and, and sisters. And so, you know, I sort of figured her oldest one would be, you know, the typical, like overachieving, you know, the good student, the perfectionist, the one who tries to do everything right. And then I wanted Joe to have a daughter who was an athlete the way that Joe had been okay. and who had different opportunities to do sports. I mean, I, I think that when my mom was a kid, like there weren't the options that there are today. Like little boys would go play baseball and would go play football and there really wasn't soccer yet. And there really wasn't much for girls to do. And so I wanted that element to be a piece of one of Joe's daughters. And then there's the surprise. There's Lila who is unplanned and who shows up sort of at the very end of Joe's fertility, basically, and is just a handful. Yeah. And I, 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 I think a lot of people have little sisters or little brothers who are like Lila, who just seem to, they, they, they've come at the tail end of their parents' energy I'm one of them. and ability. <laughs> well, but, okay, so I have a brother who's nine years younger than I am, and when I was a kid, I was not allowed to watch television. Yeah. Only PBS. Like, my parents were very strict about, like, what we could watch, what we could, you know, video games. Like, they didn't want, you know, they didn't want us rotting our brains, right? So I come home from college, and there is my brother, Joe Weiner, and he has a full-on Nintendo in his bedroom, right? right? Television set, you know, video games. And I'm like, Fran, like, what's going on here? She's like, I just got tired. <laughs> and, and so I wanted, I wanted there to be that kid, the sort of the tail end, you know, mom just got tired kid. That's basically me and my younger sister. Right. <laughs> From a family of six, mm -hmm. and we're spread out over 15 years. Mm -hmm. And no, seventeen years. Oh wow! Yeah, so, so things change yeah, over so seventeen years. Two of years. us had a whole different life from right. the others. Yes, yes, right. So that's I wanted to, you know, I think that's such an interesting family dynamic when there's that kind of an age difference, where where there's, you know, and Joe had been a married woman with the older two, and then was not, and was actually. Um, not to give too much away, but was in a different um, romantic situation when Lila was around, and I wanted to show how Lila dealt with that or or did not deal with it. Well, it's interesting, was. too, because uh, you kind of hinted at the fact that how Jo was in her pregnancy with Lila mm -hmm. affected Lila, and uh -huh. I believe that. Well, I, I don't see how it couldn't be. Like, if you're... You know, if you're pregnant and you're so happy and you can't wait for that baby, I, I don't 
I, I can't imagine how that's not going to somehow yes. impact that baby. And if you're pregnant and you desperately do not want to be pregnant and you're in a relationship that you don't want to be in, it's hard to imagine that not coming through somehow, you know, as well. So yes, that was definitely something I wanted to illustrate. Have you ever felt like the title, and this is everything, applied to you? I've experienced the feeling of having to be Ms. Everything. Uh-huh. Have you? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And, I mean, it's interesting. It's like, I, I feel like we as women do so much, and we don't always get credit for it. And I don't know if you saw today in the news the thing about Elizabeth Warren, where the Washington Post did a big story that basically said that while she was a law professor at Harvard, she was also working as a lawyer and representing clients and charging them like $600 an hour, which is the going rate for right. like a top, top attorney. And, and people were saying, if this was a guy, the headline will be, would have been, man holds down two high powered jobs. Right. But for her, it was just like, well, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. Shouldn't she, you know, why is she making money at a law firm if she's also teaching at Harvard? And like, how does that make any sense? And then I saw Kamala Harris, like for Mother's Day, you know, like this cute, in the apron, did you because see that? Because she, yes, because she cooked something that her husband liked. They right. were like, oh, uh -huh. she's not a feminist. Well, it was like, you know, the, the caption was like, you know, I'm making the chicken because, you know, I, I, no one does the marinade as well as I do. And people were giving her grief because they're like, well, her apron is creased and it's an obviously new apron that she just pulled out of the box oh, for the, and I'm like, like, we can't win. No. We cannot win. Like, whatever you do, you're going to get some kind of grief for it from somebody. And, and, and here are these men, you know, who just seem to, like, they can do no wrong. That however, however they choose to, lo to live their lives, that is A-OK. -okay. And whatever we do is wrong somehow. Yes. That kind of came out in the snowstorm powwow mm, with all the women snowed in. The, the feminine, the the conscious raising yes. scene. Yeah, that was fun. That Where was... did you get the pillow idea I from? God, right? It's a commune, <laughs> and we're going to be reborn, yep, and there's pillows yep, yep, involved. Yep. I'm I, not going to tell you. You have to I, read the book. I do not know. <laughs> that was that creative. Thing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Some of it, I just it just pops up in my brain, I love and it. I'm just like, really, brain? Really, that's what we're going to do with the pillows? But. There, that was great. Was. That was Thank great. You. Thank you. But yeah, no, the, the snowstorm scene, that was one of my favorite scenes to write because basically it's all of these women in Connecticut and there's this huge, it's the blizzard of 1978, if any of you are listening and old enough to remember that. So they can't leave. And all of the husbands are stranded at work. Like they're over the mountain. They can't get back. And so it's just women and children. And they've, they've done this like potluck where everybody's brought over whatever they were cooking whatever they were making for dinner and they've had this like feast and the kids are in bed and the women are talking and it all comes out mm -hmm. of like i i don't like being a mother or i don't feel like my husband sees me or i don't understand why i'm unhappy i have everything i'm supposed to want why why am i unhappy and and just you know that kind of honesty because it almost feels like you're inside of a snow globe and it's this one time only experience and it, you, you have this kind of like privacy where you can just put it all on the table. Yes. So, yeah. So I've read several of your books. Okay. And I've come to the conclusion uh -huh. that you are a fan of radio. I am, mm -hmm. yes. There's always a nod to radio in the yep. lives of your characters. Yep. yep. Am I correct in why, well, why do you choose to weave AM and FM through your books? Well, because I think that it's sort of a language of the time. The same way that fashion is, the okay. same way that food is, I think that what characters are listening to, um, the, the music, whether they're in cars or whether it's, you know, Joe trying to, to, to seduce somebody and putting the Ronettes on, the record player, or, um, you know, Joe and her sister listening to the Eagles and listening to Fleetwood Mac while they're driving cross country. I think that those songs tell you who the people are yeah. they, they they locate you really specifically in like a moment in time um people say that smell is like the most visceral connection to memory like you can smell something and it'll take you like right back to the first time your mother ever baked that kind of cookie or whatever but to me i think music i agree has that kind of like just snaps you right snaps you right back to some other place so that's why and i also liked how you use in the early part when they were in detroit 
Motown to mm -hmm. bring people together. Mm -hmm. It was it was uh, the the sound of Motown was something that united people. Exactly right. Like I'm talking about like the the high school that Joe and Bethy go to, where it's majority white and there are African American kids, but it's almost as though they're living in a different Detroit. Like they're shopping at different grocery stores, they're worshiping at different churches, they're living in different neighborhoods, and music is the common thing that they have. They're all listening to the same music. Yes. So we're going to take one more break, uh -huh. but I have a handful more of questions. I'm ready. I have a handful, well, how do you say it? I have a handful <laughs> of questions I still want to ask. I'm ready. Okay. We are back on the Public Library podcast with Jennifer Weiner talking about her new book. She's the author of Mrs. Everything and author of many, many books. I have to tell you a funny story. So I, I have been working on my first novel for freaking ever. Okay. And um, this it's just been a... Uh, you know, it's a journey. It is. So when I first started working on, this was several years ago, I was working with a coach and he's like, um, publisher's going to ask, who are you like? I said, I'm unique. I'm not like anyone. He says, no, you really need to yeah. like pick some people that you're like. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let me think about that. And the person who I really loved growing up was Irma Bombeck. Oh, yes. Love I love her. Irma Bombeck, right? So yes. I was in a bookstore and this was several years ago, and your book just kept jumping at me. <laughs> and it was, Who Do You Love? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was, I don't know why I was supposed to pick up this book. And I loved it. Oh, thank you. Uh, I mean, it was such a wonderful story. Yeah, I yeah. fell in love with the characters. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Andy. Andy and Rachel. And Rachel. Yeah. Oh, that story just, it was such a great story. Thank you. And so after that, I went and bought all of them. Okay. <laughs> and That's... then I went from there to Who's, uh, to, to Good in Bed. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what? Thank and I'm you. still mad that that's not a movie. Uh, right? Still mad that that's not a movie. Well, look, they made Dumpling, and they've they've made you know I, in, I, in her shoes. In her shoes, yeah. I mean, I feel like though, in terms of like getting plus size characters on the screen, yeah. like it's it's not easy. And maybe it'll happen someday. I mean, I would I would be very very happy if it did. I I would like that a lot. But you know. In Her Shoes was turned into a major motion picture. It was my second book. And, and they did a really good job with it, which is not always the case. So I, I sort of feel a little bit like I should quit while I'm ahead. You know, it's No! Like they, no? No. <laughs> okay, I'll keep going. No, keep going. <laughs> Maybe someday. And the crazy thing is about, about that particular book, too, it resonated so much with me because that was me and my younger sister. Yeah. Our, our mother had schizophrenia. Mm. And so she, she, she actually told me about it first. She said, mm -hmm. you should read this. And yeah. um, then when I did it, I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot. This is the book that Nisi told me about. But anyway, um, I went to your Facebook page, and I wrote a note to you. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> and I said, I said, one day you and I are going to sit down and talk. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're going to be friends. Okay. Did I, did I write back? <laughs> no, oh, but that's okay. No, no, that's fine. Because it was kind of stalkerish. <laughs> no. I, I try to keep up with my Facebook. I really, yeah. really do. This was years ago. Okay, though. all right. Oh, so I'm, I'm glad I'm, that we are finally sitting down. I'm so glad that we're finally doing this. What is this. your book called? It is called He's Not Here. Love it. And um, it's the story of a woman who has to like reckon with her past and her yeah. present at the same time. Mm -hmm. Her father's dying wish yep. is that she go back to school and her siblings buried him without her. So that's how it kind of starts out. Ah, wow. Yeah. That mm -hmm. sounds terrific. And it's the story of what happens when she tries to fulfill his wish. Okay, I like that. Yes. I think it's a good plot engine. I yes. like it. It's, I think, very relatable. Many, you know, oh, and she's parents, forty. I didn't mention that. Like forty. Yes. That's big, big turning point. Yes. That's awesome. So, all I'm, right, you got to, you got to do it. I'm, gonna I'm doing it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking right for now. That I am uh, working with a manuscript consultant, yeah. and I'm. Uh, this book is coming out. Okay. Yes. All it's, right. It's going to okay. happen. Okay. All so. right. You're putting it out there in the universe. I, I am love putting it, it out in the on universe. On the vision board. Now, when you aren't uh, reading or writing or watching The Bachelor, wait a minute, mm -hmm. you broke up with The Bachelor. I broke up with The Bachelor. Right. I feel like we entertained ourselves right into Donald Trump's presidency. Mm. I And I just sort of feel like, I mean, when I watched the show and the show ended and then it was the primaries I'm like oh wait here's my program right like he just became the villain you know the guy you love to hate but yeah. you don't want them to get rid of him because he's the most interesting person and I just have this like visceral terror that there are women like me out there in the world who voted for him because he makes good television so I had to like, I had to just like stop. That's powerful. I had to stop the whole reality thing. Like I just felt complicit in the machine that gave us him, which is very, it's a very bad way to feel. Complicit yeah. is bad. 
Now, so what do you do? <laughs> When you're not reading or writing. Well, I love to, uh, Yeah, I know, right? Well, about. okay, there's... I, I, I watch Killing Eve, which is okay. fantastic. I watch Barry on HBO, which oh, is super yeah, funny. Yeah. Have you seen it? It's, I have not, but... It is um, hilarious. It's have, funny because it was coming on after Game of Thrones. And right. I'm, but it was late for me. I know, right? Yeah. But I watched Game of Thrones. I watched it to Loved the bitter it. end. And yes. how did you feel about the end? I, they rushed it. Yeah. They rushed it. I mean, from a, from a narrative perspective, from a storytelling perspective, it's like all the clues were there, and if they had just slowed down and I don't understand why they didn't because HBO said let's do two 10 episode seasons and they were like nope we're gonna do you know seven episodes in season seven and six episodes in season eight and bam bam done and I'm like but well, why? I know. But why though? I, know. I mean and 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 to have Brienne have her last act on screen be filling in Jamie's blanks. Like, didn't that make you so mad? Oh, don't get me started. Right? Don't get me started. Oh, you made me so mad. I was yeah. just like, girl, you. First of you, all, yeah, you know, you deserve better. She did. You deserve. I mean, better. but you know, it's not like we haven't all dated a Jamie. Oh, we have all, you know, golden. golden <laughs> I don't know if they were into their sister, golden but golden hand and all. <laughs> yes, but I. You know, but it's interesting because I think, and I'm sure you've found this to be true also, is like once you start writing and thinking about stories, it's like it's hard to just sit back and enjoy something yeah. and not be sitting there thinking, well, I don't know why they didn't develop, you know, Danny's whole messianic, you know, colonialist, like I'm the liberator of oppressed peoples everywhere. They, it was... You know, like I said, it was all there. If they had just taken a couple more episodes I to, know. like, show her descent. You and know. we wanted more episodes. We wanted more episodes. Yes. I mean, I wanted, you know, the dragons. I wanted to know where Drogon went. and You know, but the whole thing, like, like King Bran the Broken was very unsatisfying to me. I was, And I happy. liked him. I, I mean, liked nothing him, too. Him. Right? I wanted Arya to, to, uh, to Well, run. I don't know. I, I, can I don't think she would have. She would have been really bored. She would have maybe started killing people just to, like, have something going on, you know. But I but, wanted her to show up with a different face. Mm-hmm. And, right and to kill Danny, show up like John, right. kill Danny, kill Danny, and, and then, then just be John like, gets the but, throne. But, right, but like the whole face that way, it was no blood thing, on his hand. They they didn't do anything with it. Nope. It's like they they spent seasons establishing that she has acquired this skill at great personal cost, and and then Nothing. you know she kills the guy at the twins, which you know good you know, glad he's gone and everything. But then it's like, they just almost forgot that she could do that. Yeah. And I wanted, I wanted, I wanted more of that. I wanted more of that. So what books are on your nightstand? Which, uh, what can you not put, what, what book can you not put down? Okay. Well, um, I, I, I read the Game of Thrones books in addition to watching okay. the show. And once I finished them all, I went to one of those, like, if you loved Game of Thrones, here are seven more, you know, series that you will love. So I am right now reading Naomi Novik's The Temeraire books, which okay. are all about dragons, which I'm loving those. Um, I'm reading this book that's nonfiction that's out right now called Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. Oh, yeah, I read that. Have you read it? Yes. Isn't that so good? Yes. But where you find out, like, her jerkiest patient, what happened, and I just... And I boyfriend. gasped. I was just like... <gasps> yeah. Oh, oh God. Yeah. yeah. That was... She was actually on the podcast with me. Lori wow. Yes. Okay. She... I, I'm really liking that book a lot. Um, I'm writing a mystery now, so I'm reading Ooh. lots of mysteries and trying to, like, get my plotting... Get my plotting down a little um and i'm i'm looking forward to um jamie attenberg who wrote oh, yes. the middle steins and wrote all grown up she has a new book that's coming out in the fall called all this could be yours which is about a dead patriarch and a family a, a grown son and a daughter and how they sort of handle his death so i'm interested in that jamie's also been on the podcast i love jamie yes. she's one of my absolute she's her great. dog sid is like my i every time i see sid's little little face on, on Instagram I get very happy I'm a fan of Sid's yeah so her book so you said you are working on a next book already. I am working on a next book already yes it's a, no rest for the wicked and I, I'm really miserable when I'm not doing anything okay. I, you don't want to be around me when I'm like not working so I just kind of start working so I'm yeah so I'm, I'm working on a mystery mm -hmm. oh I cannot wait yeah, it's going to be, I mean, it's it's set in the world of Instagram influencers, which is not anything I knew Ooh, anything about. Interesting. Like, all of these people who get paid to, like, wear clothes or drink tea or 
take vitamins or whatever. And it's like how you sort of establish yourself, how you build your brand, how you get followers, how you sort of locate yourself in the universe of other influencers. And it's this whole new world. So I'm interested in that. How did you come up with the idea to do a mystery? Well, honestly, after this book, I was just like, I am never doing another like 70 years of history, like all of that time and all of those characters. I'm like, I am doing something that takes place over a weekend, okay? Oh. And then I was like, what could happen over a weekend? And then I was like, well, what if someone gets killed and my character becomes the suspect and has to figure out who did it before she gets thrown in jail? where you can't influence anyone mm. Ooh, from yeah. behind bars. Right. You can't do it. So she has to, it's her, it, it's, it's the story of like these two girls who were like BFFs in high school and then one of them does something terrible to the other one and they don't see each other for 10 years and then the friend shows up and, and says, I'm getting married and I want you to be in my wedding and you were always, you know, the person I felt closest to and you understood me better than every, anyone else and I need you to be there for me and she agrees to do it in part because she's thinking if I go to this fancy wedding and I post pictures of myself in my outfits and get lots of clicks then that's going to be good for me and you know suffers <laughs> suffers because of that choice but oh I can't wait that's going to be good it's got to add it to my collection going to be good thank <laughs> you yeah so you're very active on social media. If people want to find you and, you know. Uh -huh. Say hey. Okay, say hey. so on Twitter, I'm at Jennifer Weiner. On Instagram, I'm at Jennifer Weiner Writes because some other Jennifer Weiner got to Jennifer Weiner first, which I'm really pissed about. Not really. And on Facebook, <laughs> I'm, I'm Facebook backslash Jennifer Weiner. Can't miss me. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, this was amazing. This is wonderful. Thank you for having me. Thank you for my t-shirt. I'm excited for my t-shirt. Absolutely. This and thank good. you so much for this book. Yes, you're welcome. I, I loved it. Thank you. And you've got to come back and do the show again. I would be happy to. All right. All right. Thank you.